My name is Rick Renner, and today I'm in the upper district of ancient Ephesus, and I'm seated inside the interior of the ancient Agora. The word Agora is the word for the marketplace. This marketplace was simply magnificent. In fact, it was so marvelous, I'm seated on a piece of the cornice that ran around the interior of the marketplace. The detail on this cornice is just magnificent, and it's massive. How in the world did they support all the stone cornice that ran around the interior of this marketplace? And if you had been allowed to peek into this marketplace 2,000 years ago, you would have seen rich, wealthy people walking in and out of the shops. And directly behind me are the columns of the ancient basilica, and behind the basilica is the bulletarian. Wow, bulletarian, what does that mean? Well, the bulletarian is a derivative of the word bullis, which means to counsel. When the word counsel becomes bulletarian, it's the place where all the prestigious counselors of the city gather together to make public policy for the city of Ephesus. It was such a privilege to be a counselor in the bulletarian. You had to have character. You had to have integrity to hold one of those seats. Well, if that was true of the city, how much more is it true that we have to have character and integrity to lead in any part of God's work? Do you qualify to be a leader in God's work? I think that you will find out you do qualify. God doesn't require you to have a Bible school diploma. He doesn't even require you to know theology, but there are some things he does require and we find one of them in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 4. It says, anyone who's going to be a leader must be one that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. You say, well, that's it. I'm out. My house is not perfect. Did this verse say your house has to be perfect? Did it even say your marriage has to be perfect? Did you read that your children have to be perfect? It doesn't say that. It says you have to rule well your own house, having children that are in subjection with all gravity. That's a lot of King James verbiage. You say, what in the world does it mean? Well, it's pretty important because Paul says anybody who serves in any position inside the house of God or any aspect of the ministry has to have this qualification. Ruling well your own house and having children that are in subjection with all gravity. This is so very important that that is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insight and understanding from the Word of God. Here's Rick. Thank you for joining me for today's program. My name is Rick Reiner. I've been waiting for you. And today we're going to continue our study called qualifications for leadership. We're about to wrap up this teaching, so I want you to be sure to order the series, which is called Qualifications for Leadership. It's 10 parts. It comes in multiple formats, and it also comes with a study guide. The two of these together are so powerful. What a tool. You can hear it. You can see it. You can read it together. This will really enforce this teaching in your life. And we're also offering you my book right now, which is called 10 guidelines to help you achieve your long-awaited promotion. Do you want to be promoted? Are you ready for an advancement in life? This book will help you get it. 10 guidelines to help you achieve your long-awaited promotion. Order your copy right now. And for those who become partners, we immediately send you a package of books as our way of saying welcome to the partner family. A partner is someone who regularly financially supports the ministry. And you can become a partner by going online or by calling us right now. Please pray about joining us as a partner. And if you have a prayer request, remember that we're here for you and we would really be delighted to put our faith together with you for whatever you're facing in your life right now. Denise and I often ask people to pray for us. In fact, just today, before this program began, I asked my TV producer, hey, pray with me. When we need prayer, we ask for somebody to pray with us. Maybe you need somebody to pray with you. Then call us. The number's on the screen or send us an email. We will immediately put our faith together with you. I promise you that. 
But today we're going to continue in 1 Timothy chapter 3, looking at qualifications for leadership. This has been a very intense series. We've covered a lot of things, and today we're going to be looking at a person's personal family life. And this is very important when you look at who qualifies to be a leader and who does not qualify to be a leader. And I want to start right up front by saying there's no such thing as a perfect marriage. There's no such thing as a perfect home or perfect kids or perfect parents. I know that. So please understand that what I'm going to say to you today, I'm not coming from a point of judgment or condemnation. We're just going to look and see what the Bible says, because the Bible gives us guidelines to let us know who's qualified for leadership and who is not. And the family is a very important point. So grab your Bible and let's open our Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. And we're going to quickly review the first verses, then jump right into verse 4 and verse 5. But when you come to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, Paul lays the foundation for this teaching. He says, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. We've already seen the word true describes something that's faithful, dependable, reliable, trustworthy. It's equivalent to saying, Timothy, take what I'm about to tell you as a good rule of thumb. You can depend on what I'm about to tell you. This is a faithful saying. You can lean on it. This will always be true. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. The word bishop is the Greek word episkopos. It does not mean literally a bishop, like a man that wears a strange looking hat and a black robe and a cross around his neck. This word episkopos was actually a secular word. From the word epi, which means over, and the word skopos, which means to look, you compound the two words together. Episkopos means to look over. It describes any person who has a position of management, administration, or a supervisory position. He has oversight of either people or projects. And it was used in a sundry of ways. For example, it could be used to depict the leader of a nation. The leader of a nation, like a president, could be called an episcopus because he has oversight of everything in the nation. He doesn't do everything, but he has a supervisory position over the nation. It could describe a mayor. It could even describe a construction site supervisor whose job was to give oversight to the whole building project. And in fact, that's very important because the word episkopos, which here is translated bishop, really was a word which was used on construction sites to describe construction site supervisors. Well, when you choose somebody to be a leader in the house of God, you're choosing somebody to help you build the house of God. They're not going to do everything, but if they're a leader, they're going to give oversight to the building and the upbuilding of the church. So the word episkopos, here translated bishop, really the Greek word overseer, is a very appropriate word to describe anybody in a visible leadership position or anyone who has oversight of people or projects. So for our case, it describes anyone in visible leadership who has any kind of a leading supervisory role. This could be the pastor. This could be the janitor because he's over a project. This could be the choir leader. This could be somebody who works in the parking lot. It could be a Sunday school teacher, anyone who leads people or projects. And when you come to chapter three and verse one, it says, if a man, but the Greek says, tis, if anyone, it is gender neutral. It describes men or women, anyone who desires to be a visible leader. This verse says, he desires a good work. The word good is the Greek word kalos. It describes something excellent or something noble. The Apostle Paul says, this is the right kind of ambition. When you want to be something for God, be something in God's house, that is noble. That is a good work. Wow. Then you go to verse 2. And beginning in verse 2, Paul begins to get very specific. And he says, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Let's just cover these very quickly. He says a bishop or a visible leader then must be, the word must be, the Greek word day. It means absolutely, categorically, no exception to this rule. He must be blameless. Blameless does not mean he's perfect. It just means there's no defect in his life so obvious that it would hinder other people from following him 
or this really describes a person who has a good reputation in the eyes of others. Secondly, it says the husband of a one wife. We've seen that in Greek, this really means a one woman sort of guy. That's a literal translation. It describes an individual who is committed to his current marriage. In fact, in Greek, it is present tense. A man who is committed to his marriage. Then it says vigilant. This word vigilant means serious, sober, not silly all the time. Then it says sober. This particular word sober is a Greek word which means balance, not extreme, of good behavior, of good behavior, the Greek word kosmios. It means one who has order in his life. So very important because what you have in your personal life is what you're going to replicate in any department that you are put over. Psalm 133 teaches very clearly what is on the head comes on the body. If you choose someone to be over something, what that person has in their life will flow from them into that department. If they have order in their life, they will produce order. If they have disorder, they will produce disorder. You cannot expect a disorderly person to produce something full of order. He can only give what he has. And so Paul says to Timothy, make sure when you choose leaders, they have order in their lives. Then he says, given to hospitality. I call this an open home mentality. And as I told you in previous programs, how a person makes their home available often tells you what is their limitations and how far they will go in serving the Lord. If they have a restriction and a limitation and their home is off limits, that's okay. That that often is a signal that that person won't go as far as you hope they'll go. So Paul says, look at their life and see if they have an open home mentality. Are they given to hospitality? Then he says, apt to teach. This does not mean you have to be able to teach theology or teach like I teach. It just means you have to understand that life is communication. A leader has to understand he's communicating all the time, communicating in how he walks, how he talks, how he behaves, how he gives, how he worships. A person that you choose to be a leader has to have the understanding I'm communicating all the time. And when you understand that, you live your life more responsibly. So Paul says he has to be a good communicator. Then when you come to verse 3, he says, not given to wine. The Greek word par oinas means one that is alongside of a bottle or one that has a dependency upon alcohol or any kind of chemical addiction. Don't choose someone dealing with some kind of addiction. It's not that God is against that person, but how is that person going to minister freedom to others if he or she themselves are bound? Choose people that are free so they can minister freedom to others. Then he says, no striker. This word striker in the first century literally meant striker, slapper, one that slapped somebody else, one that struck somebody else. But it also carries the idea of someone who is temperamentally explosive, someone that is temperamentally unpredictable. Don't ever choose a person whose temperament is up and down. They're explosive because it's hard to follow that kind of person. You really can't focus on your job because you're just focused on them and what they're going to be like when they show up today. That creates a bad work situation in any area of the ministry. So be sure you choose someone, Paul says, who is temperamentally balanced. Then he says, not covetous. If money is your goal, then this is the wrong business. You should not do anything in ministry for money. And Paul says, make sure you don't choose people who have money as their aim. And then finally, we come to verse four. And this is what I'm trying to get to today. And in verse four, Paul now adds one that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. What does it mean when the Bible says one that rules well his own house. Well, this is very important. The home is the place really where leadership is formed. It's formed in the home. If you can't do it at home, then you can't do it at church. Basically, that is what Paul says. And this word ruleth really describes visible leadership. It is a Greek word, proistomy. And listen to what it means. It depicts one who stands before others in order to lead, guide, direct, or manage a situation. A leader who responsibly gives oversight and direction. Any type of leader at home, business, government, or church, it literally means, listen to this, to be put up front to protect and to serve as a shield for 
others. So Paul says, before you put somebody in charge of a division of the church or the ministry, first look and see how are they being a leader at home? Are they up front? Are they abdicating their leadership or have they really taken their position as a leader in their home? How are they managing their household situation? If they're not managing their personal life, if they're not giving attention to the family, then why would you think they're going to do it well somewhere else? If they're not doing it good at home, if they're not passing the test there, then don't give them a position in the church. But if they're up front at home, if they're visible as a leader in their home, protecting their home, managing their home, this is a good sign because this really is where leadership is formed. In fact, he says, one that ruleth well his own house. The word well is the Greek word kalos. This word kalos means in a way that is viewed as good, in a way that is well perceived, or leading his home in a way that is appealing or attractive to others. When people see this individual, they say, wow, what a parent, what a leader. That person is doing such a good job at home. That gives them a testimony. That's where leadership is formed according to the Bible. And the Bible says, one that ruleth well his own house. Even the word house is very important because immediately you probably think this has to do with his wife or husband and kids. But in fact, it is a Greek word oikos and the word oikos describes the physical house. So don't just look at the family, look at the physical house, a household, including the residents of the house, the management of the house, the physical state of the house, the bills connected to everything that happens in the house, everything about a person's residence and home life. If you see a person's home falling to pieces, the wallpaper is peeling off the walls, the kitchen is filled with dishes all the time, and they think it's normal to live like that, then that's probably not a person that needs to be chosen for leadership. They have disorder in their home. They have a very low standard. And if you choose a person like that to lead something in the church, they're probably going to bring that standard into that level of leadership. They're going to produce something with a very low standard. So Paul now is not being condemning. He's just being real practical. Look at their house. How is their house? How is the physical state of their house? How is their apartment? Are they taking care of what they have? If they're not taking care of what they have, why do you think they're going to take care of what you have? So Paul says, look at the house. Then he says, having children in subjection with all gravity. This word children is the Greek word technon, which describes small children that are still under parental care. You can't hold a person accountable, a parent, for what their adult children do. They're adult, they're on their own, they can make their own choices. But when children are still under someone's care, that parent has a responsibility to teach those children to be in subjection with all gravity. This is very important. If honor and respect is not taught at home, it is an indication that there's a lack of understanding about submission to authority and honor for authority. I know in my own home, if my children had spoken disrespectfully to me or to Denise, they would have paid a price for that. Not because we demand respect, but because we want our children to understand submission to authority. Life really is about submission to authority. If you don't get that right, you're not going to do well in life. Authority figures will not want to work with you, but they want to work with anybody who understands submission to authority and those who have honor for authority. Authority figures like that. Even in the church, we have to understand the pastor has authority. Whether you like him or not, he is the pastor and you chose to be a part of that church or the Lord led you to that church. You have to have respect for him. And now Paul says this issue of authority and respect for authority is so important that look at the kids in a potential leader's home to see if the children have been taught authority. If the children have not been taught submission to authority and respect for authority, it may be that the parent themselves do not understand the importance of it. If the parent understood the importance of it, they would be imparting it to their children. So Paul said, look at the kids. And not only that, he said, are the kids in subjection with all gravity? What does the word gravity mean? The word gravity, very important word, the Greek word 
simnotes. Here's what it means. One who carries himself with dignity and treats other people with courtesy and respect. To be cultured and polite in one's treatment of others. It depicts how an individual speaks, carries himself, how he treats others. All of this reveals whether or not he has gravity in his life. It means to be cultured, to be polite, or to be respectful. Do kids of a potential leader speak to adults with respect? Or do they speak to adults with disrespect? Do they speak to adults as equals? Or do they speak up to them as those that are elders and who are superiors? Look at this. If they don't have this right, it probably means their parents are not giving it to them. This means the parents themselves probably are lacking something in their understanding about authority, respect, submission, and how to be cultured with others. Kids don't get that by accident. It's given to them by their parents. And then when you come to verse 5, Paul says, For if a man, in Greek again it says the word tis, anyone, male or female, it's gender neutral, if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? This is not a condemning or judgmental statement. Paul is simply saying, if they can't do it at home, why would you think they're going to be able to do it at church? And let me tell you, friends, if a person cannot control their kids, if a person cannot manage their family, if a person can't make sure the wallpaper stays on the wall and the dishes are clean, then it's likely that if you put them in charge of something, they're going to bring their same level into whatever you put them over. That's because you can only give what you have. So if you choose someone who has order, if you choose someone who really has a high standard, guess what? That's what they're going to replicate in any area where they become a leader. Do you see how practical this is? In this chapter, Paul never talks about education. He never talks about Bible school or a Bible school diploma. All of that is good. You should get it if you can. But beyond all of that, Paul says, here's something even more important. Do they have desire? Are they free of chemical addictions? Do they really want to be something? Is their home in order? Do they have orderliness? Paul looks at these basic, basic issues of character because these are really what qualifies a person for that moment to step forward and become a visible leader in the church. I'm out of time, but I'll be back in just a moment and I'm going to pray for you. Are there qualifications God requires for you to serve in any position of his kingdom? What are qualities that impress God? Do you have them? If not, how can you develop them? In Qualifications for Leadership, you'll find you are exactly the kind of person God wants to use. In this 10-part series, you'll learn the most important ingredient to be used by God, how to possess qualities that impress God, how to get from where you are to the place where you can be used by God. Available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $20, this series will show you what traits God is most interested in for the people that He uses, and you'll learn how to develop them. In addition to this teaching series, you can also purchase the book, Promotion. To be a leader, you don't have to be perfect, but you must be willing to grow. In this book, Rick answers hard questions about the character traits you need to get a promotion in any area of life. Each chapter reveals the keys you need for personal growth, as well as the non-negotiable traits that determine if you or someone else is ready to progress in rank, position, or influence. With promotion, you'll learn how to achieve your desired success. This powerful book can be yours for this limited time, so order your copy today for just $18. Don't miss this special offer, Qualifications for Leadership and Promotion. Call now or go to renner.org to order. Hey, this is Rick Renner. This is where I sit every morning, where I meet with the Lord and I pray for our TV family, our partners, people that I love all over the world. And this is where I prepare my TV programs. And I have to tell you that preparing the program is the biggest part. Filming the program is the easy part. It takes hours and hours and hours to make sure I've put everything together correctly for you. And then from here, it goes to the TV suite where I sit down with my producer and then he and I go over all the introductions that I have filmed in. So good to do these programs 
for the people who watch us all over the world. This is our studio. This really is where I live my life. And in this room, we prepare programs that ultimately go to multiple languages all over the face of the earth. They're primarily Russian and English. Wow, what a blessing. You know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 10, verse 21, that the lips of the righteous feed many. It's my prayer that our teaching is feeding and nourishing many people. But when we're finished with my part, then the programs go into the edit suite, and that's what takes place in this room. And in this room, you can see there's people doing all kinds of things. They take the Greek words that I prepare. By the way, it takes a long time to prepare all those Greek words, but then they have to put them on the screen. They have to adjust the sound, adjust the color. They edit the whole program together with the music, the advertisements, the prayer, everything. And we create a teaching program for you. And our goal is to bring teaching that you can trust. That's our goal, that's my prayer. And I wanna say thank you to you for helping all of us do it. It's not just me and Denise. There's a whole team here together. We're all committed to bringing good teaching to people. And your part's very important. So thank you for being a partner. Thank you for praying for us. And thank you for giving. When we come back tomorrow, we're going to move into the next verse in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6, where Paul says, Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Verse 7, Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and into the snare of the devil. What in the world is a novice? You say, oh, well, that means a new believer. Are you sure that's what it means? Come back tomorrow. You're going to find out what it means to be a novice. It's very enlightening. Hey, but I'm offering you my series, which is called Qualifications for Leadership. It's 10 parts. It is such good teaching. It's just like a good dose of medicine to get you in shape and to help you think soberly. My friend, God wants to use you. You have the right inner makings to be a leader. This series will help you to realize that and to self-correct in any area where you need to self-correct so you can step forward and be a leader in God's house. And it comes with this wonderful study guide. We're also offering you my book, which is called Promotion. The full title, 10 Guidelines to Help You Achieve Your Long-Awaited Promotion. Please order your copy right now. This is a real hands-on practical book that will help you. But I want to pray for you. Father, we all want our homes to be the best they can be. We want our physical houses to be in good shape. We want our kids to be in good shape and our marriages. And Lord, all of us can improve. Help us to improve, Lord. Help us to be an example that we would have a home and a home life that is attractive and appealing to others. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being with me today. I just love being with you. It's such a pleasure. Remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there is power. I'll see you tomorrow.